Nike stock is down big because they're losing market share to On and Hoka. And they also leaned into online sales too much during the pandemic. But they're hiring a new executive to write the ship and lean back into retail. Can they turn the ship around? Find out by checking out the latest episode of Invest Talk. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Wednesday, July 10th, 2024 edition. I'm Justin Klein here with Luke Guerrero once again. Thanks for being back with us, Luke. Always good to be back here with you. There we go. And uh, today is the same as usual. There's two of us, means two perspectives and uh, a lot more to unpack. But really, uh, this show is about you and giving you the right data as well as actionable advice that you can take the next step in your journey, which is the journey of education. Our whole lives, where we should all be striving to get better at every part from business to uh, our relationships to uh, our investing. And we're the investing side. We're not going to give you relationship advice, but we are here to help you uh, navigate these interesting times. And we do that uh, by mainly by answering your finance and investment questions. So we are ready for your calls at 888 chart We also bring topics to the table, which we'll run down here in a little bit, as well as talk about the market for performance for today. But let's tackle our first caller question now. I was calling about Altria Group, MO. It went underneath my basis. Now I just reached my cost basis. I wanted to know if I should uh, sell it or keep it. Uh, pretty much got it for the dividend. But uh, I know it's a declining business right now. Listen on the podcast. Thank you. I love, I love this call because I think it's a lesson for everyone that that's not a way to think about buying or selling a position just because you've broken even or not, um, or just what the yield is, if it's high or low, that's not how you think about it, right? It's the quality of the business, it's the balance sheet, uh, et cetera. So I, I encourage you to try to break free. It's a very common way. Uh, it's human psychology, but I would do my best to shed that line of thinking. Focusing on is the best is this the best use of the capital that I have because that's what this is right there are opportunity costs for this money and it would go into something else that uh, maybe isn't going to after a recent what is that a 20, 30 percent run from its bottom uh, now you're back to even you know obviously it's uh, not treating your capital that well uh, and you have better options probably out there so what do you think of that Luke and what do you think of Altria? I tend to agree. I think Altria is an example of a company that has had really a lack of revenue growth over the past couple of years. Revenue has actually declined uh, coming out of the pandemic, maybe at a time when the preeminent thing being thought about across the globe was a uh, virus that affected your lungs. People started mm -hmm. to think, hey, I don't want to be uh, smoking as much. And so tobacco companies, you know, you see what's happening with uh, British tobacco in the UK and some potential uh, for their business to dwindle down there as well. I think the overall trend is downward in terms of people using these products. And you've seen that in their revenue growth as well. Over the five-year period, it's only grown by just under 1%. And like I said, since 2021, it's actually decreased from 21 billion, projected to be 20.5 billion now. Uh, so you, then when you look at that and you say, okay, it's trading at a forward looking earnings of nine, that's really cheap, but maybe there's a reason it's cheap. And the reason is because the growth just isn't there. Yeah. It's interesting uh, point you made about, Hey, we had a pandemic involving your lungs and maybe less people uh, smoking. Maybe those that did smoke, maybe succumb to, uh, to COVID uh, more. And although I think there was a study that said they didn't actually, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, certainly some, uh, more people are thinking of alternatives using tobacco in alternative ways. And one example of that is Zinn, uh, which is increasingly popular. But guess what? It's not owned by Altria. It's owned by Philip Morris International. That's actually the tobacco company we own for clients, if we're going to pick one. And most people would say, well, if you look at Philip Morris International, the yield is a lot lower. Altria is eight and a half. Philip Morris is five. The novice investor is going to say, I want eight and a half. I don't want five. I want eight and a half. But the reality is they, Philip Morris has much better revenue growth because of the diversity of their business, as well as the fact that most of their business is international, whereas Altria is entirely domestic, where 
you know, international uh, use of tobacco products are continue to be pretty strong, whereas domestic, not so much. So once again, this is a perfect example of somebody chasing yield, not paying attention to the balance sheet, which uh, Philip Morris continues to, you know, have a, a decent amount of debt. Yes, they have good cash flow, but a much more levered balance sheet than something uh, like a Philip Morris. So uh, I would certainly be selling it and redeploying that capital in something that's treating your capital much better. Thanks for the call. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover over the next 45 minutes or so. And our main focus point is about Nike. And there is a return of an old Nike executive that could potentially boost the stock price. And this was a man who was uh, in charge of retail wholesale uh, partnerships and distribution channels. And so uh, will this bring... Nike's performance uh, back to something that the market uh, is in love with again, as opposed to right now, obviously the market is not happy with the stock. So we'll dig into that story and the specific case about Nike in general. Now, we also have voice bank questions in regards to uh, GPE ratio and Starbucks. We also have some other topics on the docket. One is about car prices, the other passive investing and how uh, you know, is there an AI bubble and how is the passive investing uh, craze adding to the current AI bubble? And then lastly, if we have time, you know, there's a, a recent case of uh, debt defaults within the private uh, debt markets that kind of can tell you a little bit more about uh, the broader uh, private uh, debt markets as well. So we'll dig into that if we have time. But ultimately, this is about you and your questions and we will get to your questions via the comments section over on our YouTube channel as well. And most importantly, your live calls at 888-989-CHART. Now we're going to take a short break and on the other side, we'll talk about today's market activity. But please remember, you can call anytime and leave your question on the Invest Talk Voice Bank. The number never changes. It's 888-99-CHART. Enjoyed our insights on Invest Talk? Great news. Our podcast is available on all major platforms. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And get the latest in investment advice across Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Subscribe now and join our community of informed investors. Now, look, let's take a quick look at the markets today. It was a decidedly positive day overall. Uh, What kind of sub themes were you seeing? You know, I think day two of testimony on Capitol Hill from Powell uh, really drove the narrative today. I think if you think about the the trading volume that's been happening early this week, a lot of it is related to the comments coming out of the Fed, though most of it is business as usual, maybe slightly more uh, dovish than some people would have expected, hinting at the deteriorating labor market and the economy, and that maybe we're getting close to a point where we can think about having a conversation. I know it's a lot of qualifiers uh, Mm -hmm. about cutting rates, but I think overall the market is more interested in what the new inflation numbers are going to say tomorrow, uh, what they're going to say Thursday. um, And what else is happening this week? Isn't something else happening this week? Mm, I mean, earnings season starts next week. Bank earnings. That's what I was going to say. I don't know how to escape my head. Especially bank earnings as well. We say this all the time. Bank earnings are a harbinger for the rest of the economy. So I think overall, what's going to drive the weekly returns on indices is still to come this week. Yeah, the uh, it was interesting today with that dovish uh, Fed Fed speak uh, uh, in Washington was really small cap value to the best up one and a quarter percent large cap growth only up about a quarter percent so pretty big uh divergence there uh, on the day despite nvidia up about two and a half percent tesla up about half a percent um you had some it's a big gainers hawaiian electric uh kimiko which is uh, a uranium miner a lot of the uranium plays uh did very well today there was some news on that can you unpack that luke uh, yeah, so the news is like you said, it was driving some of those some of those names. Uh, today was a re- a uh, proposal that came out on how Medicare was going to uh, 
cover uh, radiological treatment. Mm. And so that was beneficial for some of the companies that were involved in that. Obviously, uh, some of the names that we own for clients were up, were up big today on the back of that news. Um, so overall, a good day uh, for, for companies within that industry. There we go. Well, that was the market today, but let's get to your questions. And we get a lot of them submitted via our YouTube channel. So we encourage everyone to head over there Watch our videos, uh, see the data that we are putting up on screen so you kind of understand what we're talking about in context and ask your question and you might get your question answered. And Matthew Bird said, hi, Justin and Luke. Thank you again for your amazing show. It's a part of my daily routine. You've taught me so much about markets and investing. I have a question about OPCH. Valuation looks reasonable. Insider buying is encouraging. Financial health is strong. And the chart to me, an amateur looks good. Triple bottom. Let me pull that up. OCPH. I'll tell you whether that's true or not. Oh, O O P C H. There we go. Typed in the wrong symbol. Uh, well, it's definitely in a trading range. I don't know if I call it a triple bottom, but it's been in a trading range really since uh, mid 2022. Uh, he also says, my only worry is projected margin compression over the next few years. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, it has hit the 200 a week moving average, so that is pretty good support. Um, so yeah, it is at a good support level. What are you seeing on the fundamental side, Luke? Yeah, on the fundamental side, the revenue growth has been pretty good over the past five years, about 700 million back in 2018, projected to be 4.7 billion this year. Um, that's still pretty significant growth, 300 million growth in revenue from the year before. In terms of margins, it looks like their net margin peaked out, uh, well, last year at about 6.2%, um, but it's kind of re mean reverting back to where it's been over the past four years, projected to be 4.4% uh, this year. But really, the thing that strikes me is probably the most beneficial, with the exception of the most recent reporting period, is if you look at a, a chart of their cash flows going back to 2019, it's exactly how you want to see it, straight up and to the right. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's very beneficial in putting this company in a good position. On a debt perspective, only about $1.1 billion on a $4.6 billion market cap company, so not a lot of leverage there either. Yeah, and for everyone else, uh, what they do is they provide home and alternative site infusion services. So treatments of bleeding disorders, neurological disorders, heart failure, anti-infectives, uh, and chronic inflammation disorders. So obviously post COVID, you know, there's been a lot of, of that, you know, COVID there's long COVID, uh, that's wrecked havoc, wreaked havoc on a lot of people. Uh, and you obviously have a, an aging baby, baby boomer population. So, uh, all those things I think were, were tailwinds to uh, their business and they were losing money pre pandemic. So, you know, what is the right size of, of their business and, and their profitability, I think is a big question because earnings are expected to fall about 20% this year. And that is, uh, to me, a bit of a worry, but it is at support. Uh, I think it's a reasonable valuation here at $5 billion market cap, like Luke said, good balance sheet uh, and good cash flow. So I'm going to give this one a thumbs up, mainly because you have an easy out. If this drops, you know, below, let's say $25, it's at $27.52 now. Uh, I think it's a clear indication that uh, this is not just a consolidation period. It is a, a true rollover in the stock. Um, so it makes, to me, uh, a pretty compelling risk versus reward proposition because it sh could easily break out back up into the low 30s. So I would give this one a, a mild thumbs up based on the support level. All right. Thanks for the call. 888-99 chart, 888-992-4278 is how you get through and ask your question on today's show. And we're heading into our first long break uh, of the of the show, of the hour. And but we are ready for your calls, your live calls. We love your recorded calls. We love your comments over on YouTube, but we most of all love your live calls. So don't hesitate to reach out at 888-99 chart. Love today's Invest Talk episode? We want to hear from you. Drop your investing questions in the comments below, and your question could be the star of our next segment. Subscribe and stay tuned to see if your question gets answered by Luke and I. Dive into the comments now and become a part of our next conversation. Let's go talk to Art in, oh, sorry, we're going to talk to Sammy in San Francisco. He's looking at AMD. Yeah, uh, thanks, Justin, for taking my call. 
I uh, would like to get your views on AMD. I wanted a good entry point based on how the perform how the stock has been performing lately. Um, would like to get your views on that. Well, AMD did peak back in March near 100 and almost 130 or 230, around 225 or so. And it fell all the way to 140 and change. And now we're at 183, nearly 184 at the close today. You know, AMD is kind of the you know, second choice behind NVIDIA. If you're looking at graphics cards, it's also probably still second choice uh, from an overall valuation perspective compared to like an Intel, if you're looking at CPUs. Um, but they made a lot of progress throughout the years. The question is, are they going to benefit from the trends in AI, the trends in personal computing, uh, the way that, say, NVIDIA um, it, it has recently? So, and if you look at the earnings, last re- last quarter, revenues were up 2%, earnings were up 3%. And you're trading at, uh, I mean, if you go by forward-looking earnings, you're still uh, nearly a 40 uh, times multiple. Um, so, and analyst estimates continue to come down for this year and next. So, I don't know. I I don't know why anyone would pay th- these multiples for a stock that historically is very very volatile um, in a sector that is very very volatile. What are your thoughts, Luke? Yeah, well, they they uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the market reacts tomorrow. They just announced an acquisition of a uh, private AI lab um, that they've been looking to expand to the European market and take on uh, potentially a role in um, autonomous vehicles and and, and such like that. Uh, but I do agree with you. I think you know if you're going to pay forty times multiple, which is a Nvidia multiple. Uh, you should be looking for NVIDIA revenue growth and NVIDIA profitability. And one of the big strengths of NVIDIA within this space and why it tends to be a little different from some of these other names is that they have fully incorporated the ability to, you know, use the the CUDA code within their chips to make the entire process of large language models faster. So I think that within this space, if and I, I still think that, generally speaking, I wouldn't purchase NVIDIA either. Um, but if you're going to pay NVIDIA multiples, you're probably going to want similar revenue and profitability, and you just don't have that here. Yeah, and I pull it to a monthly chart, and this had a huge topping tail reversal uh, in the month of March. And typically what happens is you get uh, you get conf- confirmation with a follow-through, which you got in the month of April. Uh, but oftentimes you get a retest of near those highs. It doesn't break out, but it gets those highs and then it fails. Uh, That's how these typical chart patterns work. And it's working towards a retest of those highs, but I think that's as good as you're going to get. So if you want to try to play the short-term trade of of that retest, which, you know, granted could be another 10 to 20% higher from here, um, sure. But as a long-term investment, I would not be owning AMD. Thanks for the call. Let's go to Art in Menlo Park, looking at NVO, Norvo Nordisk, a GLP-1 play, if I remember correctly. Do you own it or looking to buy it? Actually, I own it, uh, Justin, how are you and uh, Luke? Um, I own it, and um, I got in at around 115-ish. Okay. And now it's like 142-ish. Mm-hmm. And I was just wondering if you, um, you know, because there's, there's been uh, quite a bit of news, so uh, I was thinking I was going to take some profit since it's run up so much so fast. Yes, what's your views on? It? Yeah, I, I do see some uh, momentum waning on the chart. Now it isn't dramatic, so you know it is still in an uptrend. Nothing has broken, uh, but it is trading at a pretty high multiple. And these are the type of names where uh, there's, it's a very crowded trade. And when it breaks, it will break probably pretty violently. You'll see a big 10, 15, 20% uh, drawdown in a short period of time. And it's hard to know when that is or what the catalyst will be. So I would be looking for more maybe a rebalance because the trend is still positive. But, you know, this could easily get to 150, 160, 170 um, just based on momentum alone until something, like I said, breaks. Um, so, yeah, I, I like what you're thinking, um, but I wouldn't necessarily sell it all because the the chart uh, still looks good um what are you seeing uh luke 
Yeah, I tend to agree. I think they do have the potential to drive growth uh, for some time to come. I think it's important to note uh, that their valuation is very high. Yeah, I think you know that. You've said that. Um, but also important to note is that their uh, patent within the U.S. actually expires in early 2026. Um, mm-hmm. So they could lose some advantage there as well. So I would look to trim. It sounds like you're up a pretty decent amount in valuations, pretty high. So, you know, trim into those high value buys, I would say. Yeah, trim and put in a trailing stop. Thanks for the call. Now, today's focus point is about Nike, and there is a return of an executive, and I think we are heading towards a break, so we're going to get to this after that break, but uh, it's a pretty interesting time for a company like Nike with a lot of uh, brand power, but, you know, the parts of their business has certainly been, uh, been attacked and attacked well, uh, mainly the running side of their business. Uh, and, but they've also had some self-inflicted wounds, such as pulling out of a lot of retail agreements with companies like Foot Locker. So uh, they're starting to do a 180 on that, and they brought in an old executive to do that. So after the break, we will dig into this story a little bit more and maybe get some perspective, give some perspective on how we think Nike can turn things around in the long term. Now, the next and best talk, we'll look into the story behind this headline. 2024 cost of living, HCOL versus LCOL states. As we navigate the current economic landscape, it's crucial to understand the stark differences in cost of living between states. We'll get to that story tomorrow. But for now, I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and we are ready to take your calls at 888-99-CHART. Do you want to take your investment strategy to the next level? We invite you to visit investtalk.com and submit your portfolio for a free review from us. This is a fantastic opportunity to receive personalized advice and insights to enhance your results. Don't let this chance slip by. Go to investtalk.com, submit your portfolio, and let us help you on your journey towards greater investment success. Let's go talk to Chris in Florida looking at Paycom, P-A-Y-C. It's been in a long downtrend. Are you trying to bottom fish here or do you own it? Um, yes, yeah, so I own it right now and was just wondering what you thought about the company and the fundamentals of it. Well, the fundamentals look fairly solid. Uh, but obviously it's in a strong downtrend. I think it was drastically overvalued kind of uh, during the pandemic. And what they do is they make HR software. Uh, It hit a peak really when growth stocks hit a peak around uh, November timeframe of 2021, nearly $550 per share. Now it's down to 140. And in a very strong downtrend, relative strength is seven. Does pay a 1% dividend. Revenue growth is slowing, but it's... Still 11% revenue year over year, earnings 5%. Um, so the fundamentals are okay, uh, but growth is, growth is slowing and thus multiples are coming down. Uh, what are you seeing, Luke, on your front? Yeah, you know, I remember answering this question a couple months ago, mm-hmm. and I believe they had this AI platform, BETI, mm-hmm. that essentially cannibalized a lot of their own business and for cheaper. And that's why some of their margins have been compressing. And even though you see that, you know, some, some sales growth, though, I guess it's projected to fall uh, going into this next year. Fundamentally, they're not as sound um, as they appear to be. Um, and so you've seen cash flow. I mean, it's still, it still looks good, but I think growth, like growth prospects for them uh, aren't as good as they were a couple years ago. And I think that's one of the reasons why the, the price of this company has been falling off, you know, 58% in the past year. Uh, 32% year to date. Yeah. And uh, from a technical perspective, it is putrid. Below all the major moving averages, it had a move down in late May from about 180 all the way to about 145. And it's been shopping sideways now at $140 per share. That is what is what we call a classic bear flag. And it's likely to break lower yet again. And you know, when you see a stock, despite the fundamentals, 
in a just strong downtrend, that momentum is likely to persist until there's some sort of catalyst or indication that it will break out of that downtrend. Now, that could be a good earnings report. That could be, you know, rumors of them getting bought or whatever. Um, But more often than not, it's capitulation. It's all these people that bought into the hype a few years, years ago. They finally throw in the towel. They finally say, okay, enough is enough. I'm down 70, 80, 90%. I'm sick of this name. I want to take my tax uh, losses and I want to move on. And that's another thing here is we're heading to the back half of the year. Typically, these names that are down a lot, they've been down a lot for multiple years, they're going to get more selling pressure as you head into year end due to tax loss selling. So I think this is headed much, much lower between now and year end. Maybe you get a capitulatory event near year end. Um, but that would be the only indication for me that I would probably jump into this name. It's interesting because I think there's still a, a decent business in there, um, but it's still trading at, I think, a, a little bit above fair value. Um, and if their earnings growth uh, and revenue growth continues to flounder, uh, it could easily go much, much lower. So I, I would sell it and move on. Keep an eye on it. Wait for that capitulatory event. And then maybe you can get back in. Thanks for the call. Now let's get back to our focus point, and it's about Nike. Nike is down on its luck. Let's see. It's 41% below its 52-week high and well below the $180 it traded at back in late 2021. Now it's at 72. And for a name like Nike with such a such a great brand, uh, I think it's brand, It's one of the top five brands in the world based on uh, recent rankings. And, you know, lo- part of it is, hey, their business has been, uh, their, their market share has been uh, eaten away by companies like On Running and Hoku, uh, mainly in the running space. That's where they've talked about in the recent earnings report that they're having some issues. You know, they're still very strong in places uh, like basketball and, and sportswear, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, they've also had some internal uh, mistakes. And one of the big ones was looking at the pandemic, and many companies did this, and said, oh, look how many people are buying online. Look at our margins there. And let's focus all there and own and, and get rid of these lower margin uh, ways of distribution, which is through retailers, saying less people are going to retailers. Well, guess what? The economy reopened. More people are going back to retailers and they're buying. And so they've kind of started to create a 180, uh, turn a 180 on this. And they're rehiring a retired senior executive. His name is Tom Petty. Yes, Tom Petty. And he is, he, he was a veteran executive. He worked uh, uh, in, what was it? Uh, he was the vice president. He's returning as the vice president of Marketplace Partners. Um, and I know, Luke, you have a great joke on this. Oh, the Nike stock was free fallen. Yes, exactly. It was a great <laughs> joke. He said in the office, and we all laughed. And it was we had to bring it to it, you. Yeah, yeah, we had to bring that joke to you. One of one of uh, Luke's best. That's what uh, what he's bringing uh, in the office. And so, anyway, uh, Nike is stated in um, uh, earnings on June twenty fourth that uh, you know they're they're bringing him back. And you know, will this be enough though, Luke, to right the ship in Nike, or do you think the problems run a bit deeper. No, I think Nike was hit with, yes, a uh, poor direction in terms of marketing strategy, but also just some very bad exogenous variables as well, right? You had Chinese growth not being what the, what people expected it to be, the recovery not really being there, demand coming out of China being poor. Uh, you have uh, really a lot of businesses that are nipping at their heels from a more niche way, your, your Vioris and your, your Rones and all those, uh, those products that used to be dominated by Lululemon, you actually see Lululemon stock price fall as well. And so I'm actually curious, you know, you said that Nike is one of the five probably most well-known brands. And I agree with you. I think the reason why Nike will do well is because Nike is so ingrained with U S sports, uh, franchise with U S sports franchises and leagues, but also international sports franchises and leagues. And so writing the ship, Seems to be, to me, I never say this about companies that just because they exist today means they'll exist tomorrow. It seems to me that it's probably it's probably an inevitability with Nike. But it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned one of the five most well-known brands, and I'm thinking of another brand 
that brought back somebody that is one of the five most well-known brands. This actually a CEO when they were floundering, uh, Bob Iger, mm -hmm. and you know with Disney. And so uh, sometimes companies tend to reach back to a past where companies were more successful. I don't know if this play will will work out or not, uh, but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I actually think it will because I think this is this is a, an own goal here. Um, and once again, as I said, a lot of companies did this, so it's not a shock. And uh, I, I, I think the big issue for Nike is a bit deeper. Now, we do think it's a, a good value. We started to pick a little bit up nibbling for clients uh, here down around these levels um, because we do think there is great value to the brand long term. Um, but, you know, when a company starts to focus too much on margins and not enough on, uh, especially when it's consumer facing, not enough on the experience that uh, their customers have when they go and, and buy the brand. That's one reason why I think a lot of the retailers are very good is, is you know, people walk into a Foot Locker and uh, it is uh, laid out very well. And 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 it's kind of a, a cool thing to go and see the latest and greatest of, of the shoes that are there. And so, um, you know, I think getting back into Foot Locker and other uh, retailers will be helpful uh, for them. But ultimately, it comes down to the the innovation. And if they can bring back some innovation and bring back some exciting new products uh, and, and, and connect that with a brand that is obviously uh, very strong, I think uh, it could turn itself around very quickly. I think you just have to come to that realization. And I think this is the first step to say, okay, we need to get back on the right track. And hopefully this is the first step. Now we've got a lot of material to fit in today. And of course, we like to give pre preference to your questions. And here's one that came in earlier on 888-99 chart. Hi, I'm currently reading uh, Steve's book, Above Average Investing. And I'm, I got a question about the GPE ratio. Um, in, in reading his book, I learned basically how the GPE is more valuable to evaluate the growth of a company versus like the PE ratio and deciding on investments or whatever. Um, I was just wondering how exactly is the GPE ratio found? It probably said it in the book, and I probably just missed it. But uh, I've read various things about using the earnings per share growth ratio to the uh, revenue or earnings per share growth forecast versus the uh, revenue growth forecast for like five years. And I'm, I'm just wondering what metric I use. I, I know it's some average growth metric divided by the PE ratio is how to get the GPE ratio from what I understand. I'm just trying to figure out what growth metric I use specifically for that calculation. If you guys could help, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Well, the GPE ratio is yeah, growth to PE. Uh, so if the PE is 20 and the growth is 10, that means the GPE ratio is 0.5, right? If the growth is uh, 40, then the, the GPE is two. Okay, so uh, now what growth rate are you looking at? you it's, it's earnings yes um now you typically want to look at it over an extended period of time three five years ideally so you you get some sort of average um so you understand kind of the consistent trajectory of uh, of profitability um now it's a crude number it's a crude metric to look at um and you'll have to calculate it yourself and see what works um it's it's definitely not the only uh, metric to look at it's just helpful in understanding okay am i paying a reasonable multiple for the level of growth that I'm getting here. You know, I look at Procter & Gamble as a good example. You know, Procter & Gamble is typically growing about the growth of the economy, maybe a little bit more due to operating leverage. Uh, but revenue earnings are supposed to be up 7% this year and 6% next year. Was up 5% last year, 3% the year before. So you're talking about a roughly a, a 5 to 6% growth rate uh, of earnings, and you're paying 24 times earnings. Now, it's a solid business. It's probably not going anywhere. Good balance sheet. So I might pay, I might be okay with a little bit lower GP ratio, but ultimately I think that is um, a, a good general metric to understand how much you are paying for the level of growth that you are getting within a business. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Luke? Uh, you know, nothing really to add. I will say that more often than not, it's actually presented as a peg ratio, price yeah. earnings to growth. Yeah. Um, so if you are looking through, um, uh, you know, any of those data providers, uh, you probably are going to want to look for PEG, P E G, uh, rather than G G P E. But, um, other than that, nothing to add. Thanks for the call. Let's go talk to Bill in Northern California. He wants to talk about Starbucks. Bill, you there? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can. Yep. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I'm just saying it's, Starbucks is revisiting its low that it made this year. Mm-hmm. And what do you think? Uh, I bought a position at that time. I'm wondering if you think it's going to go lower or just stay down around here. Well, its major support is around $65. It's at 72 now. So I think there should potentially be more. Um, long term, I do think it's a pretty reasonable value uh, down here. Um, as uh, things kind of uh, right size, still expected earnings growth this year and next year, although those estimates are coming down. Um, so and once again, this is kind of like Nike. It's a, it's a great brand uh, and uh, you know probably needs some tweaking. But historically, these companies with great brands, they, they have uh, good businesses to fall back on, to use cash flow, to maybe revamp the brand, change the, the consumer experience, et cetera, uh, and, and typically come out of it um, in, in good position. You know, where that ultimate low is, that's hard to say, um, but uh, I do think it's a, a decent value uh, down here. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for the call. Now, look, let's talk a little bit about car prices, car prices. And we knew throughout the pandemic, car prices were headed much, much higher, mainly due to lack of supply, which is hopefully everyone's learned that supply oftentimes is uh, uh, just as important as demand. Um, and so, you know, it was it was kind of a for the problem was twofold, right? A lot of demand, not enough supply, and the average uh, price of a car went through the roof. But recently, through June, the average price paid for a new vehicle fell three percent year over year, so same period year over year, to about forty five thousand dollars. That's still kind of a lot, right? Forty five thousand uh, for the average car, and analysts continue to expect that to come down. So, what impact do you think this will have? on inflation as well as the broader automobile market. Yeah, well, I think generally that has been one of the things that had had propped up inflation for some time, right? Rents, uh, uh, autos. And so as the kinks in the supply chain that really propped up the the resale market on cars. I mean, there was, there was a point in time a year or so ago that I was considering selling my car just because I thought, when are we ever going to see a greater sell proposition than we have now with the current supply? So I think in a time where we're trying to combat inflation, this is going to do a lot towards getting some of those areas of that basket of goods that have been sticky. Yeah. Uh, how, what were you going to do if you sold that car? Use your walk. I was going to walk, I was gonna walk uh, the two-day walk to work. Two two day walk to work. I could go on Google Maps at the break and figure out exactly how long it would take me to walk from my house to our office. There are Ubers though. No, I'd walk. No, you walk. Okay. Well, uh, nonetheless, the average selling price uh, remains well above pre pandemic levels. So it's not like where we we've uh, reverted back to uh, a normal market. And the monthly payments uh, for a new car reached a record high of seven hundred and forty dollars in the second quarter and a lot of that has to do with higher rates so uh for a little while the higher rates didn't really have much impact on the automobile market but that certainly is uh coming to fruition now and uh recent uh, announcements from ford general motors and tesla all fell and so uh you're seeing that finally um have an impact on uh sales and What's interesting is that there were about 2.7 million vehicles on dealership lots or en route at the end of May. That was up 50% from a year earlier. And you're starting to see a, a uh, return of the, uh, of the promotion, um, especially on uh, financing offers. And so um, you're starting to get a car market that is more imbalanced. And if you are looking to buy a car, it's starting to get better for you. Now we're heading into a final break, but we're ready to take your calls now at 888 chart Love today's Invest Talk episode? We want to hear from you. Drop your investing questions in the comments below, and your question could be the star of our next segment. Subscribe and stay tuned to see if your question gets answered by Luke and I. Dive into the comments now and become a part of our next conversation. Uh, hi, Luke. This is Nick in Hayward. I want to get your opinion on a stock called Chewy. The symbol is C H W Y. 
I think they're into pets, foods, and stuff like that online and everything. I want to get your opinion. I'm thinking about purchasing some and uh, just want to see what you think about it. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great day. Bye. Well, he directed the question at you, Luke. This is the recent Roaring Kitty pickup. So what are your thoughts on maybe riding that Rory Kitty, Roaring Kitty train? Well, you know, as a, as a business, I, as a consumer of this business, because as you know, I have, I have cats, big cat guy. Do you purchase, uh, I have a dog, so I buy off Amazon myself. My mom has a cat. She uses Chewy. What about you? Classic dog guy interrupting the cat guy. Uh, no, okay. But uh, no, I, I do use Chewy. I use Chewy for toys. Mostly I use Chewy for toys when I need to buy other things. You got to hit that minimum, uh, which right. from a, you know, uh, actual spending perspective, you should not pay more to hit a minimum just to get free shipping because you end up paying more than the shipping. Life lesson for you all out there. But as a consumer, I like Chewy. As an investment, Anytime you get a lot of hype in a business because uh, some Reddit trader comes in and discloses an over 5% position, don't do it. It's just you don't know where this is going to move. You don't know the volatility of it. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. It could easily move against you. It's currently at its price target um, from all of their analysts. It's trading at a P to E of 96. 96. That's 2x NVIDIA money right there. So uh, I would say I would say pass. I like I like the company because I use the company. But as an investment, I would say no. Do you like him because his name is Roaring Kitty? You know, I thought about that, uh, how funny it was that he decided to have a large position in, in a, uh, a pet, pet yeah. uh, you know, online pet store. So, but irony I'm, aside. I'm, sh- I'm sure that <laughs> nudged him that direction. Maybe. Right? I mean, he did say in front of Congress that he was not a cat, if you recall, when he... Uh, when did he someone testified. ask him that? They thought he, thought he was a furry or something? No, I think he just said, I'm not a cat. Uh, okay. I don't know, man. I, anytime <laughs> these guys get in here, it's it's just it spells danger for retail. You know when if you wanted to invest in Chewy, you know when you should have bought it the day before he announced that he held the position in it. Anytime after that, <laughs> it's it is. Yeah. Who knows where it's going? Yeah, I mean, as a trade, ask the if, guys who bought GameStop at the top if they if they appreciated buying GameStop because it was in the news because yeah. of this guy. No, I will say it just started its move back in late May. Uh, was that? Sixteen dollars. Now it's at twenty-five. You know, good move. But uh, you know, based on in, in GameStop um, parlance, you know, this is not that big of a move. And the technicals are are fine. Had a recent pullback. I could see this as a trade. But just like GameStop and all these other ones, you know, you you want to get off that train before everyone else does. So uh, understand that, that is very risky. It's hard to know, especially for the novice investor who tends to uh, they try to. Uh, they're, they're poor at, at, at taking gains. Let's just say that uh, they try to squeeze every last gain out of it, as opposed to you know hitting a double or triple and and being happy with it. You know they try to hit a grand slam. And so um, if you want to take that risk and, and ride the roaring kitty train, then you know I I, I think as a small position, sure. Um, but know what it is: a speculation, not an investment. So uh, you have to understand kind of who you are exactly. Uh, I think that's it. I don't know if we have time for our last topic, which we were going to get to. I think there's too much really to flesh, really to flesh out. There's frankly not enough time to to flesh it all out. But um, that about does it. We thank you all for tuning in to Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and oh, we can do a voicemail. Never mind. Go to a voicemail. Let's do it. Sometimes I keep on their toes. Regarding Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce ticker symbol is CM like to know if you think it's a good stock and like purchase it, but I'd like to get your opinion. Thank you very much. Bye. Oh, CM, uh, a looks like a regional bank, but out of Canada and the chart looks good. What are you seeing on the fundamental side? Luke? Uh, from a fundamental perspective, it looks like it's interest income exploded in 2023, which you would expect, uh, with rates increasing its interest expense also exploded its net interest, uh, income, has fallen over the past year or so. I think it's going to suffer from a lot of the issues that are suffering that regional banks are going to be suffering uh, with, and that is uh, uncertainty about how the duration of their of their uh, investments are affecting their balance sheets. I like bigger banks. If you want to hit the banks, I tend to stay away from the smaller ones right now. I would agree with that sentiment. 
Thanks for the call. Well, that really does it for Invest Talk. We appreciate it. I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and that completes another Invest Talk program. Thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more amazing content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Your support means the world to us and helps us create more videos that you love. Subscribe now and join our community of savvy investors.